Hello and welcome and in this lecture you are going to learn about the basics of the CHIP8. So what is the CHIP8? The CHIP8 is an interpreter from the mid 1970s. It was originally designed to make the development of games easier. Essentially CHIP8 is a virtual machine so think of the Java virtual machine of today but something far more basic. That was essentially CHIP8. Chip 8 interpreters can play many classical games such as Pong, Tetris and Space Invaders. Chip 8 makes a great emulation project because it is simple to integrate. So what are the Chip 8 internals? Well, the memory layout of the Chip 8 has 495 bytes of memory. Take a look at this image here. You can see that the start of the chip 8 RAM is at address 0x00 and the bytes between addresses 0x00 and 0x1ff are reserved for the chip 8. Inside this memory region we store things such as character sets but more on that later. You can see that chip 8 programs start at address 0x200 and the, the program data and the program itself consume the rest of memory. The chip 8 also has a stack that is an array of 16 16 bit values used to store the address the chip 8 should return. Um, so when you call a subroutine in the chip 8 it'll push the return address to this stack and then when you return from uh, that subroutine it'll pop it back off the stack so then it can then carry on executing from where it just came. So the chip 8 allows up to 16 levels of nested subroutines. And don't worry too much if you're struggling to follow. This is a brief overview and we'll be coming back to this as a reference as we go through the development stages. So another note, another important note is that the stack is not part of main memory. So as I state here, it's an array of 16 16 bit values. So it is separate from main memory. The chip 8 has 16 8 bit data registers. You know, these are kind of used to store general data such as the score in a game. Uh, for example, in Pong, uh, you could use these data registers to store how much score each side each team has and and so on, right? Obviously, because they are only 8-bit wide, they can only hold one byte of information per register. So the chip 8 data registers should be implemented as a character array with a size of 16. Because of the way the instruction set is designed, and we'll get more on the instruction set later, but because of the way it's designed, it makes sense to, to use an array uh, for these data registers. And you'll see why as we start development. So the chip 8 also has a 16-bit register named I. This, uh, this register is generally used to store memory addresses. So uh, these are separate from the data registers, the 8-bit data registers. Chip 8 has a program counter. And basically the job of the program counter is to point to the memory address of the instruction that we're currently executing. Right? When we are ready to go to the next instruction, you increment the program counter by two bytes and then uh, the next instruction will then be executed. In the chip 8, uh, instructions are two bytes in size, uh, which is the reason why we increment by two. So the chip 8 also has an 8-bit stack pointer and this points to a location in the stack. If you remember uh, early on in this lecture, I spoke about the main memory and the stack and how they're different and so on. Well, the stack pointer points to a place in that stack, right? We increment and decrement the stack pointer when we call subroutines and when we return from subroutines. So the chip 8 also has a sound timer and a delay timer. And these are 8 bits wide. And when above 0, they decrement at a rate of 60 hertz. So let's first discuss the sound timer. Chip 8 plays a beep when the sound timer is not 0. And this is implementation specific, so you pick the frequency of the beep. It's literally just any any type of tone, essentially, um, but not multiple tones, right? That's what the standard allows. So 
Uh, it can be a, a beep, uh, a bleep, you know, it can be like any type of sound you like, but the sound should be consistent. And um, the sound timer decrements at a rate of 60 hertz, and when, it, when it's zero again, the sound no longer plays. So the delay timer uh, works a little similarly to the sound timer, apart from instead of playing a tune, it delays the program. So what will happen is it will stop executing instructions when the delay timer is above zero. And then it will decrement the delay timer at a rate of 60 hertz. When the delay timer is zero again, the program resumes execution. So essentially the program just doesn't continue running when the delay time is above zero. And then it will be decremented at a rate of 60 hertz. As soon as it's zero again, the program will start uh, carrying on running from where it was. Uh, think of it like pausing a game, right? A little like that. Everything stops, right? Same sort of thing. Apart from it's uh, based on a delay and not an action. Okay, so the display is probably the most complicated part of the chip 8. Mainly because of sprites. But we'll get on that soon. So the chip 8 has a display size of 64 by 32 pixels. It's a monochrome display, which means it can only have one color. Pixels only have one color, right? They're either on or off. Um, so the pixels either on or off, and that's a monochrome display, basically. So we can see here the white means it's on, black means the pixel was off, and this is a screenshot from Space Invaders on the chip 8 emulator. So drawing to the chip 8 display is done with sprites, as I just said, uh, not pixels. So when you draw a sprite to the display, if it somehow goes out of the screen bounds, what happens is it wraps back around to the other side and starts drawing the pixels that went out of bounds from the start. Think of Pac-Man, you know, you know Pac-Man when you go through one side and, it's, and Pac-Man comes out the other side, right? Uh, you know, when you go all the way to the right of the screen and then it comes back to the left, it's the same type of thing. So sprites are many pixels grouped together that can be drawn to the screen as a whole. So think of copy and pasting an image into Microsoft Paint, right? It doesn't just paste one pixel, right? It pastes the whole image. So that's a good way to think of sprites. So these are sprites in the chip 8 for the number 0 and the number 7. So I want you to notice something here, right? To the right here is hexadecimal. In the middle is binary. And on the left is just um, just a little character equivalent that I've drawn just so you can see uh, what's happening, right? So notice here, 1 means the pixel's on. 0 means the pixel's off, right? So if we look here, we can see 1, 1, 1, 1, right? And then if we look at the character equivalent, we see that asterisk, 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 right? So the rest is blank because the final four zeros here, the final four bits here are zero, right? If they were all one, then we'd see eight characters on this first row and not four. Again, if you look at the second row here, you look at the binary equivalent, one, zero, zero, one, and you see that this one's on, this one's not, this one's on, right? So you can see the two bytes here are zero. So that's why it gives us a completely empty middle. And then finally we end it with a one again. So I hope that makes sense. You, you can see how that's working, right? So uh, sprites can be a maximum of eight bits in width. Uh, you know, hence eight bits in a byte, right? You can clearly see that each row is represented by one byte by looking at the binary equivalent here. So they can also be up to 15 bytes in length. So that's our y-axis. Um, so when I say length, I mean row. So we can see here, this is one row, this is one row, this is one row, this is one row, and so on, right? So um, again, uh, eight bits in width because uh, there's only eight bits in a byte, but it can have up to 15 bytes in length, okay? So that, that that's sprites for you. And uh, we know, we know how the length of a sprite because there's a draw instruction in the chip 8 um, instruction set where we specify how many rows to draw. So that's how it knows, okay? We'll, we'll get to that later. Okay, so now let me explain how the drawing procedure works. So the sprites get drawn to the chip 8 display 
And if the pixels go out of bounds, so you know the X is above or equal 64, or the Y is above or equal 32, then the breach in pixels wrap back around to the start of the display from X coordinate zero or Y coordinate zero. So if you draw quite a large sprite, and I don't know, maybe half of it breaches the bounds, the other half will be drawn at the start of the display, right? Uh, while the other half will be at the end of the display. Hope that makes sense, but if it doesn't, don't worry, because this this lecture is just to show you the, a brief overview. We'll go into much more detail later on when we start implementing this. So sprites are also XORed onto the screen. If you don't know what an XOR is, you really need to research that, because um, this course, there's a lot of bitwise logic going on. So um, it's, it's a bitwise XOR, so you can look that up. Um, that's not, uh, it, bitwise operators aren't too complicated. But uh, they get basically the sprites get XORed onto the display, and if this causes any pixels to be erased, then the VF register is set. So if you remember earlier in this lecture, I spoke about um, uh, the data registers, right? Well, the VF data register is set to true or one, I guess. I guess it'll be one. It's set to one if um, and. If when we XOR this sprite to the screen, it causes any pixels to be erased. Otherwise, we set the VF register to zero, right? So if nothing is erased, then VF becomes zero. So the chip 8 has a keyboard with 16 keys from 0 to F. And you can represent this in, an, in your emulator as a 16-byte array with a true value in the array, meaning the key is pressed down and a false value meaning the key is not pressed. So chip 8 programs will essentially say is the F key down or something, right? Or is the A key down? Or is the 1 key down? You're, you're responsible for interpre interpreting that instruction depending if that key is down or not. So that's why we represent our keyboard as a 16-byte array. And obviously what we would do then, we would map the real keyboard because you're not playing on this old hardware, right? We're not we're not making this emulator for this old hardware, okay? So obviously you're going to be using your PC key, keyboard, right? So we'll need to do some key mapping. Uh, so you know if if they press uh, decimal zero on on a, on a desktop keyboard, for example, it would set uh, the chip eight's keyboard to zero because this is virtual hardware, remember, right? But uh, don't worry too much about that. Uh, all will make sense soon. So this is the actual layout of the chip 8 keyboard. Obviously, because we don't own this real hardware, uh, we can't really represent it like this. But essentially, this is what it looks like. So the instruction set of the chip 8 has 36 different instructions that need to be implemented for a successful implementation. So uh, these instructions are responsible for mathematical operations, drawing, and a lot more. Uh, including like bit, bitwise and bitwise or and so on. So uh, we'll explain more about the instruction set as we go through this course. But this has been an overview of the chip 8. Many thanks. Thank you for watching this part of the course. You can find the next part in the video description.